welcome to episode 8 of Star Citizen Retrospective, where we're going to look back a year ago when they were talking about Hover Mode, Hurston's Transit Systems, and the Mercury Star Runner. I am your host, Space Tomato, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my tomato seeds for joining me. Let's dive in. As per usual, starting the week off with a calling all devs question for Eddie Hilditch, Global Environment Lead and Sick Boy at the time. Now there are two types of questions that are asked regarding this game that I think are easy for the devs to answer. Those are the when questions and the will questions. Eddie happened to luck out and he got a question that asked both of these words at the same time. When Arcorp gets added to the game, will we also see the addition of the Aaron Halo asteroid field and its gateways? In lore, the Aaron Halo belt is a giant asteroid belt situated between Crusader and Arcorp. This asteroid belt is so big and so thick that it requires giant Arcorp owned gates just to navigate through. Now I'm not going to waste your time getting into details about how traveling through massive asteroid belts is going to work. The bottom line is the answer is no, we will not be seeing that asteroid belt with Arcorp and we did not see it when Arcorp was added into the game. Not only is this something that won't come until all of the planets are finished in Stanton, but with all these big asteroids it's also going to require some additional, more advanced asteroid rendering and creation technology. Something that's currently scheduled for Alpha 3.7, but hasn't seen any work yet. And with all this being said, you still can find massive asteroid fields out there in the middle of nowhere, sometimes even situated between Crusader and Arcorp. So who's to say there's no fake Aaron Halo waltzing around here acting like the real deal? Next up, we got two questions for Vehicle Pipeline Director and Calling All Devs MVP, John Crew. And guess what the first question he got was? They were asking about hovering on planet surfaces. How perfect is that? <laughs> this has been a hot topic lately as the addition of hover mode was just added to the game in 3.6. Now I'm not going to get too deep into it because it's been discussed to death in the last month, but I'll drop a couple links with some information for you guys in the description of this video. Now the question was specifically asking how ships can hover in such weird orientations in atmosphere even though some of them have VTOL thrusters specifically designed for hovering applications. John gave two answers to this question, explaining why in atmosphere hovering still appeared so off at the time. First, the maneuvering thrusters were too powerful in atmosphere, allowing ships to hover in any orientation which looked unnatural, and second, the VFX of the thrusters were the same in atmosphere as they were out of atmosphere, which appeared differently due to the dark background of nothingness that space is. Now maneuvering thrusters do appear to be weaker on all surfaces of our ships not pointing down at this time. This can be made apparent by tilting your ship and subsequently finding yourself headed for the ground because your ship can't maintain that position. But we are still lacking those mentioned VFX that will really sell the experience and show the hard work that either our regular hub thrusters are doing or particular ships VTOL thrusters are doing to keep us up in the air. And while John did mention those plans they had to change the experience through the changing of the maneuvering thruster output, we did not hear any statement about the changes going into those thruster VFX, so we're still waiting for those with no deadline in sight. And while I do have my own opinions on hover mode, cause who doesn't, this is not the place I would like to air them out, and we have seen many, many, many many competing opinions and criticisms on the matter. Regardless, I'm sure my opinion is represented somewhere in here. And fear not, my friends, according to some who attended the Aegis event, we are looking to see a hover mode rework in 3.7. Oh, sweet Christmas. The next question from Mr. Crew was another one of those easy peasy will questions. Will we see atmospheric planes or aquatic amphibious vehicle concept sales this year? This year, you guys get a little too specific with your questions. And of course, the answer was a not at this time, with a tentative maybe in the future hanging in there a little open-ended. But don't lose faith, I'm sure you're going to see somebody with their 890 jump in the water because that thing looks like a cruise ship. 
And don't forget about those mysterious hang gliders and the 100 eye concept art. Not that that's going to turn into anything though, don't, don't quote me on that, please don't quote me on that. The next guest in this episode is senior systems designer with possible Marvel superhero named Johnny Jasivius. The question for Johnny was will there be weapons rest character positions to help prevent provoking attacks when we look at other characters or NPCs in the game? And Johnny was like, yeah dog, of course. He said not only did they want this for players, but they wanted it for NPCs so that you could walk into a room and quickly understand who's all uptight, who's trying to shoot everybody, and who's trying to be your friend. This was actually added into the game as a first implementation in Alpha 3.3 last year, and while some people want a hotkey to be able to assign your weapon to this sort of low ready stance, as of right now you can only do it by holding F and using the interaction menu. Sorry everybody, no keybinding yet. And with that, it's time for Around the Verse, August 23rd. We start off this week's episode of Around the Verse with a look at the UI work they were doing at the time. UI has struggled quite a bit in this game, and while we've seen some beautiful concepts, most of the current implementations still feel a bit rough. While these displays are in-game and currently working to an extent, what we are really waiting for is the building block system, which has been mentioned on Star Citizen Live on both July 20th, with a special UI focused episode, and August 2nd. And I do expect to see a more visual segment on the system in the very near future, and you can quote me on that. Just remember that when it comes to UI, especially in ships, we do have some improvements on the horizon, however, who knows when those will be actually delivered. After this, Chris pointed us towards the new mission giver due for the game, Clovis Darnely, who is now in the game offering the famed Down Satellite mission. Before passing the microphone on over to Will Weisbaum to talk about the mission system in the game. Now according to Will, whenever they added a new location, they would have to go back and add all of the mission possibilities to that location. As you can imagine, this process got a little long in the tooth. So they decided to develop a system that allowed for them to tag missions so that they appeared at the specific locations that they wanted them to, no matter where they are or what location was added. This is something I talked about in a recent episode of Retrospective. It seems like a good system that should lower the amount of work per location, but at least as of 3.5 we can see that delivery missions did not factor in this system, as they still had to add delivery missions to the R-Corp area, at least as far as the roadmap is concerned. Now a couple of weeks ago we saw the progress they were making on the customs area in Hurston. This time we went ahead and checked out the train station platforms to see what work they were doing. I don't think the sense of scale really translated from the concept to the real product. But I do think that as far as the overall atmosphere goes, they pretty much nailed it. Now, while I've got you here, whoa, whoa, whoa. While I've got you here, let's talk about the FOIP updates that they did during this episode. <laughs> Now they discussed some of the changes that they were making to the system and for the most part like I've said before, the system's working pretty well. You need some good lighting, you need really good lighting in your room to make it work great and I don't have great lighting here so you can see that it's not really completely picking me up but for the most part, nah, nah, nah. it works, yes it does, it works. Mm -hmm. Next up, we got to see some of the elevator work they were doing on the models back in the day to show us how they were going to make elevators twist and turn to get us from one place to another without teleporting us. This was just brought into the game in Alpha 3.6 for the transit system improvements we saw. And you can test this out with the ultra high speed elevators you'll find in the rest stops right now. Speaking of rest stops, the next segment in the episode was highlighting their new efforts to build asymmetric rest stops with improved advertisements and lighting. Just recently in 3.6, we saw the update of rest stops which add a lot more variation to the type of systems that we're getting from what we see here. 
and currently slated to come into the next update is variations in rest stop interiors so it will look different also from what we're seeing here we've actually seen a little sneak peek of what some of the new interior rest stops are looking like right now Finally, to wrap up the episode, we took a look at the Constellation Phoenix. We've actually had this ship in game for a while now, I believe since Alpha 3.3. It's a nice little quaint ship, people love it, and it's looking pretty good compared to what they showed us. Still haven't seen this piano yet though. Hopefully by the time we get that in game, we get some fingers over IP so I can go ahead and play some silly songs for you guys. And now, possibly my favorite concept to date, we got a first look at the Mercury Star Runner. The Mercury Star Runner is a beautiful ship, an absolutely gorgeous mid-sized data runner ship. Unfortunately, data running is not something that's in the game now, and even more unfortunately, we have not heard anything else about this ship since the reveal, besides a Reverse the Verse Town Hall episode, as well as a Q&A, neither of which had those juicy bits of detail that we all want to sink our teeth into. Now it looks quite good next to its bigger sister, the Star Lifter, and as they wanted it to be an asymmetric ship, you can see some of the influence they took from the famous Millennium Falcon, which led to a nice smooth but kind of industrial looking design in my eyes. You can see here the numerous amount of concepts that they went through to see if they could come up with a good design, many of them being symmetric. They decided to lean away from that as they got further and further into the development process. Now as I said earlier, this ship's been pushed far back with no news on it since this initial announcement. Not only that though, data running itself is nowhere to be seen as the careers have been pushed further and further along on the backlog. That means that not only do we not know what this ship is actually capable of, we also don't know what the career it's based around is going to consist of. This has been a topic of debate on and off on the subreddit and on Spectrum, but until we get further word from CIG themselves on this subject, it's all speculation for now. But you guys all know that once this ship is in our hands, you can come straight to Space Tomato for the top shots and some data hauling gameplay as data running is one of the top careers for your boy, the main tomato. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining me and I hope you liked it enough to subscribe. Tune in for next week's episode where we're going to be looking at Lorville City Districts the various cyclone variants and having a nice little sit down chat with todd pappy thanks again for being around for this one i'll see you guys next week